a micro, um, I work for an independent water treatment consulting firm and lab. We don't sell chemicals, we don't sell equipment. We basically help everybody make sure that the water treatment companies are doing what they should be doing. And then they have a direct impact on, on water conservation and also uh, treating the buildings and stuff. Um, I do have the advantage and I get to see a lot of, a lot of water treatment companies. I get to see a lot of applications. I get to see a lot of cooling towers. And I'm gonna share some of those experiences with you. So what, what do we see out there? Well, we don't see a lot of good things in many cases. Um, white rust is some of the things that have been around haunting us for a couple years. For anybody that has, how many people have galvanized towers? Here's, how many people see white rust here? Okay, uh, basically white rust is, is zinc carbonate, okay? Basically these towers are coated with, with galvanized, okay? And the galvanized is basically a sacrificial metal. That's its design. Its design is to protect the, the under metal surfaces of the cooling towers and so they coat it with zinc, basically. Well, zinc does not like high alkaline water, okay? And so it forms zinc carbonate, which are white bubbles, rust pockets basically on the, on the surface in there. And so what you're doing, you're basically leaching out zinc um, and forming zinc carbonate. And you can take these things like little dust things and, and uh, remove them. But the problem is you're removing the, the barrier that's protecting the, the um, steel cooling tower itself. Uh, we're seeing a lot of our clients moving away from galvanized towers. Unfortunately, they're still very, very inexpensive. So we still see them coming out. So there's, there might be changes in the water treatment program that you need to do to help protect that, especially in the first 90 days. These towers need to go through a process of passivation and pH control to, to passivate that zinc barrier uh, before you start the water treatment program. If you don't do that, you're gonna see pretty rapid deterioration of these towers, so they won't last very long. Obviously, with all the technology we have, we're seeing still way too much scale formation in cooling towers. Here's an example of a plant I visited a couple weeks ago. Um, it's a high hardness area of the country, um, and they just didn't uh, take a look at their, their water treatment the way they should. They basically scaled up their entire fill right there. Once you scale up a system, it's, it's, it can be cleaned. It's just it's painful. It's, it's very painful because the only way to really remove scale is by dropping the pH, which puts the tower system somewhat at risk from a corrosion standpoint. So there are ways to do it, but the best way is don't let it happen, happen in the first place. Obviously, the, the one thing that cooling towers do have is that they are perfect breeding grounds for biological activity, um, as well as algae. Algae needs sunlight on top of everything else, but when you think about it, a cooling tower has the heat. That's what you're trying to remove, so it's, it's a warm environment. It's got water, okay? If you ever sat next to a cooling tower, stood next to one, it's got, you get sucked in, you know, because it's basically an air washer. So it's sucking in nutrients, materials, suspended solids, so you're feeding it, you got warmth and you got water. So it's a perfect breeding ground for biological activity. One of the things that, that you wanna do is that if you look inside the tubes, if you have a condenser tube, most of the tubes now are what they call enhanced tubes. They're enhanced not only on the outside on the Freon, but they're also enhanced on the inside. And it's basically a rifle barreling that goes through there. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. Can you see that very well? Did it come out in place? Basically, it's a rifle bearing that goes through the tubes, and the purpose is, again, is to, is to increase the surface area of the tube. So by rifling it, you've got the valleys and grooves and everything else, so you actually, you actually increase the surface area of the tube, allowing better heat transfer surface. Um, one of the problems is a lot of people don't look. They can look at, when you do your tube inspections, okay, you only see about the first three, four, five inches, but you really can't, can't see down the tube. Okay, so when we have boroscoping or we send an optic eye down there, we can actually see the inside of the tube and what's happening in, in the different hot zones of the condensers. In this particular case here, we see the, the black material is a fouling material from, from biological and dirt and debris. We're seeing a little bit of the copper corrosion over here. The green is, is actually copper oxide. And we're starting to see a little bit of scale formation on, on top of the tubes. Um, if, if you were to run an eddy current, and of course they did on this plant, they ran an eddy current study down there, which is basically determining the thickness of the tubes. Um, the eddy current showed that this tube was fine. There was no problems, no defects in this tube. But you can see that this, well, this tube is heading into some disasters in a couple years because the water treatment program is not really effective. You're either going to scale it up, you have some copper corrosion, which is eventually going to go through the, through the copper itself, which the eddy currents will pick up. The question is, will you do the next eddy current before you have a, have a tube failure? And you're seeing biological activity, which we'll talk about biologically influenced corrosion. So it's always a good idea to, to try to do both boroscoping as well as eddy currents in between times to find out what's going on. 
nice thing about borescopes is that you can see what's going to happen to you in a couple years. Eddy currents obviously tells you whether or not you're actually seeing metal loss in the tubes. These tubes are 25 one thousandths of an inch thick. I don't know if you can visualize that. 25 one thousandths of an inch thick. You don't have a lot of room to work with. You know, they normally condemn a tube when it's 50% loss. That's 12 and a half thousandths of an inch. So the tolerance levels are very, very small, and they do that on purpose because they, uh, the heat transfer efficiency is so great on that. Nice thing about the boroscopes is we can actually take perpendicular angular shots of the tubes themselves. Here's an example of, of a tube that's got biological fouling. Um, you can see the enhancements right here, and you can see the biological, it's like a gelatinous material that's in between these things. Um, that actually acts as an insulator. Uh, to the tubes as well, and also causes biologically influenced corrosion. In other words, bacteria basically, in its metabolic rate, secretes acids. So right there on the pipe surface there, you're going to secrete acids, and that could cause damaging to the tubes. Here's an example of, a, of an enhancement where it was completely filled with biological activity. Okay, so all the enhancements were, were, were filled up, and actually this machine is losing efficiency and could cause problems. This client right here, finally, it cost this client about $100,000. Um, here we actually found a hole in the tube itself. It actually pitted through the tube right there, allowing water to get into the Freon side. And, and water and Freon don't mix very well. Very aggressive material. Um, it causes rapid corrosion inside the chiller. So this, this cost about $100,000 to, to replace this chiller and, and re retrofit this chiller because of the, of the pitting occurred in the, on the tube surface itself. I know this, this picture is fuzzy, um, but here's an example of, of uh, you can see the, uh, the, actually the enhancements right there. You can see the copper corrosion. In this case, you can also see tube defects. This is where the enhancements have actually split off from the tube itself, um, so it's actually a tube defect from the manufacturer. We certainly recommend eddy currents and, and uh, boroscoping be done on all new chillers. Um, it takes away the finger pointing a year later on, on whether or not um, there was actually tube defects or not tube defects. Um, it's not uncommon to see tube defects, guys. Uh, we just did a, um, a property out in Hawaii, brand new chiller, 1,200-ton uh, chiller, two of them. Uh, we uh, eddy current borescope, we had 50 defective tubes. Um, so um, it's not a good sign. That's, that's, an, that's, that's ugly out there. But uh, it's not uncommon to see these things. It's nice to get those things documented and get baselines done uh, right away. Here's an example of a closed loop system. Closed loop systems are not immune to corrosion and biological fouling if you don't treat them. Basically, they have, most of them are steel pipes, so they, they, they close them all up. Here's an example where we saw a lot of corrosion in the pipe surface itself. The piping itself is iron, it's FEO. Okay? We, take, we take ferric oxide from the ground, we actually mold pipe. A uh, pipe does not want to be in a natural state of iron. It wants to be rust. That's where its natural state is. So it wants to go back to that natural state. And so we help them with, by using water and, and other corrosive environments, it actually corrodes quickly. So the problem is in these closed loops, if you don't take care of them, they actually start restricting flow through, their, through the systems there, and then you lose heat transfer efficiency on the, on the equipment. OK, so the potential loss of energy. Um, obviously, to optimize your energy dollars, you certainly want to watch your approach temperatures on your machines. It doesn't take a whole lot of film of scale or deposits to cost energy in these machines because they're so efficient, okay, right now. So, for example, if you had a one one-hundredth of an inch of scale, now that's about a thumbnail thickness or less of scale formation, assuming you have a 500-ton chiller operating 15 hours a day, 150 days per year, which, which might not be too awful what you guys do up here. Um, depending on the KW uh, cost in the area, um, you could lose anywhere from six to twelve thousand dollars annually in electrical costs just by having a small film of, of deposition on the tubes. 